Good morning, good morning. Good morning to all my fellow lovers of the word. And I'll say good morning out to the, who I know to be the regulars. Of course, welcome to everyone who's listening. And I know uh, Teresa, uh, Elizabeth, or Liz, and uh, Quentin, and maybe uh, uh, Olivia, uh, Nick. I think that's mostly my people I see on a regular basis. Welcome. Good morning. And I'm probably working hard at the food bank at the moment, but it, uh, I know you'll catch this later. And thank you so much for your dedication to helping out there. Such an important thing, which we kind of touch base on a little bit here today in this study. So uh, let's get into the word. First, a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you so much for this time to spend time in your word. Thank you, Lord, so much that uh, uh, for all the things you've done for us, especially this week, Lord, as it being the week that you you gave up your life for our sins. You dedicated yourself to our salvation. We can't thank you enough. There's not enough thing we could do to, uh, to honor you in that way. We give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, I've been thinking a lot lately about people who just uh, who just don't honor Jesus. I give him proper credit for the things he's done. I know that in my life I've had to deal with people who just uh, really uh, are derogatory towards God and Jesus. And it's, it's hard for me uh, to listen to people who, uh, who uh, disrespect the Lord by using his name in a... Uh, in a, um, in a fashion that's uh, negative or that uh, is a, like a swear word. And that really, really bothers me. It always has. Uh, and I know it must bother him. And I know it, it would bother me. And it seems like his name seems to be the, the, the use of ridicule by so many people. Uh, so as we, as we celebrate Easter this week and we think about that, uh, may we think about uh, uh, the salvation of all those out there that, uh, that need the Lord, and that we uh, work extra diligently to uh, uh, make that happen. And Jesus, uh, can't do enough for you, Lord. Uh, and thank you so much for all you've done. So, uh, let's get into this word. And we're not in Genesis. Don't know where that came from. But let's get the right, just read the last two verses of what we covered yesterday, just to get a flavor. Uh, we'll be working on uh, verses 13 to 23 today. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou should take knowledge of me, seeing I am just a stranger? Uh, this is Ruth talking to Boaz. They just met. And uh, and she's wondering why uh, Boaz is being so nice to her. Being she's just a, a stranger. She, she doesn't know. Uh, he hasn't known her. Verse 12, the Lord recompense thy work and a, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. Well, I can't help but look at that verse and think uh, that uh, she, you know, being a Moabite, she grew up believing in other gods. Uh, this called, uh, they, they worshiped this, this evil god Baal, uh, caused a non-existent uh, god. As there is only one god, the god of Israel, the god of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is someday the only God there is. And so she's recognizing here that uh, uh, that uh, the God of Israel is the one and true God. Verse 13. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. Well, Teresa, I wanted to throw in your verse, and this is a good place to put it in, because we are looking at Naomi here in a different spirit. Like I said, she came from Moab. Uh, she grew up knowing only uh, only an evil god, Mo Moak, uh, uh, Molak, Molak, or uh, one of those, or Baal, Baal worship. And here she is, she decided on the road coming here, and it's in Ruth 1.16, and it's a beautiful verse. It really talks about the dedication that a husband and wife have for each other. And I can't help but think about it. It's a beautiful uh, verse 
uh, for one uh, for a husband and wife to share with each other. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go, and whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people should be my people, and thy God my God. And we just read in verse 12 that uh, that, my, uh, that Naomi did was living up to that uh, that promise. So along that same lines, the Lord has provided over and above what she needed. Uh, when it comes to uh, what, uh, what we're going to see here coming forward, a couple of verses that talks about this are in Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Phil, uh, Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Uh, that's, that speaks volumes of, uh, of uh, uh, Ruth here. Because she dedicated her life to uh, probably never uh, achieving much, being a foreigner, uh, being a Moabite, uh, as I mentioned before. She was not well uh, re uh, uh, received by most people that would be the thought of where she came from. And so it's uh, going to be a beautiful thing here. We're going to see Boaz that accepts her for who she is and not where she came from. And I think that is so important uh, to really... Treat people as a, as a person, not, not based on their past or where they came from. Verse 14. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou thither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached, uh, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. So he's actually invited to have lunch with the uh, regular reapers and the uh, uh, and Boaz himself. Uh, that's quite an honor for somebody who's a stranger. Uh, so Boaz is really showing some uh, really kind of affection to her. Verse two fifteen. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, "Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not." See, typically that uh, when it came to gleaning. Uh, they were only supposed to do certain areas of the field, like around the edges, uh, and they weren't allowed to go certain areas on the field uh, to glean. Uh, and here Boaz has given her permission to glean anywhere she wants to, amongst the sheaves. The sheaves is where they would stack, uh, basically they would take uh, and stack the, uh, the grain in these like uh, uh, sheaves. Uh, and they would store them that way and carry them away to be thrashed uh, later on. And uh, we may get into that a little bit when we talk about the thrashing floor scene. Uh, but that uh, basically that uh, they had to knock the uh, actual uh, part that you eat off of the stock. And that was thrashing. Well, before they were thrashed, they were kind of like bundled up into sheaves. And so wherever they were storing the sheaves, she was even allowed to go there for anything that was falling down on the ground. Verse 16. And let fall also some of the handfuls of, on purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. I can see uh, Bo, uh, Boaz's uh, servants looking at it going, what? <laughs> uh, so basically he was telling them, yeah, and drop a little bit here and there to make sure she gets, uh, she gets plenty. <laughs> uh, he was really being nice to her. Uh, maybe twofold. Maybe he just you know, saw something in her that really made her feel, uh, feel good. Something I might want to point out too is that realize that Boaz most likely was a relative, uh, probably uh, a cousin uh, to Imelech. Imelech would have been Naomi's husband. So most likely Boaz was a lot older than, uh, than Ruth. Uh, that was not that uncommon, uh, but particularly at this particular stage, uh, Boaz might have seen her more as a, almost like a younger sister, uh, as somebody... But, but there's a lot of uh, accounts that think that she was very beautiful also, so that he saw something else in her. Uh, and it wasn't unusual in that time frame for uh, particularly uh, men to be older than their wives, uh, quite a bit older, actually. Uh, sometimes even you know, 10 years, 10 or 15 years wasn't unusual. Some people believe that uh, Joseph was quite a bit older than Mary, for instance. Uh, and that was not very, that was very common. Because men would uh, take time to get established, so they would be older. And typically, once they got established in a business or something, that's when they would get married and have children. Typically, that, that in that case, then uh, 
a young lady always dreamed about being married. And so that typically there were, that's why there was kind of a delay uh, in age groups. So moving on, there's a good chance that anyways, that Boaz is quite a bit older than her. So he might have been thinking about her more as a, as like a, a, a younger sister. Uh, and I think it, it's symbolic too that uh, we should look out for our, uh, for the kids, uh, for the people younger than us. That, uh, uh, as we uh, gain in wisdom that we're uh, looking out for those younger that are uh, just coming into the world and helping them out and not being uh, and trying to help them to uh, grow in wisdom. Uh, verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out that she had gleaned. That's that, that beating is what I was talking about. You actually beat it against the ground and it knocks the... Uh, uh, Kind of the way they do it, if one understand. I, I might even try to find a video because I've never really seen it myself. But somehow they beat the stock against the uh, rocks, and what happens is, is that they, uh, uh, the good part of the wheat will come up into the air and kind of like drift in the wind. You know, kind of come into a pile, and then they take the stalks and they put them off to the side and they burn them later. And so you have this pile of wheat, and then you have a pile of stalks. And they call it a thrashing floor. And they usually try to pick a place uh, that uh, has like a, a constant breeze uh, so that they, uh, uh, the, uh, the part you eat actually uh, will kind of drift downwind a little bit. Let me, uh, so continuing, I have verse 17. I just realized that... Uh, I miss. I already mentioned that. Oh, I thought so. Uh, I forgot to mention when we were in verse 14. Uh, it mentions there too where it says the uh, parched corn. Uh, I thought I mentioned that. that uh, parched means dried out, in case you didn't know. So it was basically dried out corn. It was like dehydrated almost. Uh, so where was I? 17. Yeah, so she gleaned in the field until the evening. So a couple of things to point out here. She had a really good work ethic. She worked until the evening. So she was there at sunup and, and worked until sundown. This speaks volumes too, I think, to, to Boaz and the rest of the staff. And she was she was willing to work for what she got. And I think that she didn't they probably didn't really have a big problem uh, giving her a little extra. Over in Proverbs 3127 talks about this. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Uh, basically, that uh, idle hands, uh, she uh, she was willing to work uh, for what she had. Did I read verse 17? Oh, yeah. So she gleaned in the field till the evening and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an epath of barley. And I thought I mentioned that an epath is actually... Uh, about a, uh, a bushel, and I'm not sure how many of you might know what a bushel is, so I'll show you a picture. This is just a picture, so I don't think I need to worry about uh, doing a... Uh, Big pointer. Just gonna put it on the right screen so you guys can see it. Almost there. Okay. There it is. That's a bushel basket. I think probably if you've been anywhere around a farm, you've seen one. I remember uh, growing up back east, I used to see them all the time, particularly around the orchards. Uh, it was pretty common to fill those up with apples and sell them that way. So you can see the dimensions. It's about nine and a half inches high. It's about 14 inches in diameter. And then, so you fill that up all the way and that's about a bushel. That's a lot of wheat. Uh, you think about when you convert that to flour, uh, you can make a lot of bread out of that. Uh, so the amount she got that day was that much. <laughs> so they, they were really uh, generous to her. So back to where we were. <clears throat> I 
So verse 18. This is kind of beautiful too. Uh, I remember when she was eating lunch with the with the with everybody. Uh, she didn't even uh, didn't even uh, she only ate what she needed, and she actually saved a little bit uh, and took it back to Naomi. And it's mentions here in verse eighteen, and she took it up and went into the city. And her mother in law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. So she gave to her she she gave to her part of her lunch also besides the gleaning. Uh, really showing a really good ethic uh, as a daughter. You know, uh, you notice here uh, in a few verses, we're going to see that she actually calls her as her daughter. I think she went from daughter-in-law to daughter uh, at this point. But speaking of uh, speaking of being uh, like this, over in First uh, Titus, I mean First Timothy five four. But if any widow have children or orphans, let them learn first to show piety at home. And to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. And you can see that uh, that either through Naomi's uh, being a, a great mother, and over over the years that uh, that uh, Ruth picked up on that, or maybe she, her father, her original father and mother were very uh, dedicated to this also. But at least now she was she was uh, atypical of a uh, a good upbringing. Verse 19, and her mother-in-law said unto her, where hast thou gleaned today? And so at this point, uh, I don't think, uh, it seems like Naomi doesn't know for sure where she was at. Uh, and where wast thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, the man's name was with whom I wrought today is Boaz. So it sounds like the first time that uh, Naomi is hearing uh, that she was working with Boaz. I thought I mentioned it yesterday, uh, but this might be the first time. I don't remember now if I mentioned it yesterday or not. Okay, she hasn't been home yet. Yeah, okay, it was yesterday I was talking about it, but she hasn't been home yet. It's the first time she's talking to Naomi. That's right. Get my day straight here. So thinking about this, uh, over in Psalms 41.1, uh, talks about this a bit. A Psalm of David, blessed is he that considereth the poor, the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. So this man Boaz has really taken an interest. And uh, let's talk about Boaz a little bit. Uh, Boaz actually has a very uh, interesting history. And I don't know how much it ties in or not, because uh, I can't. I spent a couple hours researching this to try to find out if it had any tie-in. Uh, but I thought I'd mention it. There's a little known fact that there's uh, uh, in the temple. Let me show you a picture. Okay, there's a picture of the temple. And if you notice... No, I need a different setup here. Hold on. I didn't get the big cursor. I don't know if you can see it or not. Oh, let me get it. I didn't think I was going to be pointing today, but I guess I am. Okay. You notice these two pillars on the outside of the temple. Well, they actually, they were given names by Solomon. Uh, well, they, well, actually, the, 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 either Solomon or the man who made them. It, uh, they're not positive because they use the word he. I'm kind of going to show you those verses. But they they got names that are rather interesting. One is named Jenkin, and the other one is named Boaz. And realize this is Solomon's temple, and this was built... Uh, uh, well, this is a replica of Solomon's temple, actually. Uh, this is actually a replica of... of, uh, of uh, Oh, it was the second uh, temple period, Herod's temple. But the same two pillars are there. Uh, in Solomon's temple, it had the same thing. In fact, uh, I had a nicer picture. Let me get grab it real quick. So 
because it actually uh, the, the pillars actually look really a lot nicer. So uh, let me grab one real quick. You know me, I like my visual aids. <laughs> uh, it was a good picture of the pillars. Now I can't find a picture of the pillows. I guess that's as good as picture of any. Okay, there's the two pillars. They had some really fancy artwork on top. That's why I wanted to, this is actually Solomon's temple. It's actually a bit smaller than Herod's temple, but it was actually very majestic looking also. Uh, anyways, uh, let's uh, go back to what I was saying. So talking about Boaz and Jack, uh, not so much Jakin. Uh, remember that in, he, in Jewish that uh, all names have, uh, uh, have, uh, have a meaning. So these two, two bronze pillars erected at the entrance to the vestibule of Solomon's temple, construction of the temple, and I'll put it back over here since I'm not reading verses at the moment, so you can see it. Construction of the temple in Jerusalem began in 966 BC and was finished seven years later. The story of the building of the temple is found in 1 Kings 7 and 2 Chronicles 3. In order to have the best possible fitting in the temple, Solomon hired a man named Hiram, from Tyre to do the bronze work. Uh, I almost I realized that bronze in the Bible always signifies judgment or uh, because it can withstand fire. Uh, so that uh, it has to do with judgment or the lack thereof, maybe. Was known for his wisdom, understanding, and skill in bronze working. Now I got to bring verses back in. So I want to read through 1 Kings, and this is where it talks about it. Uh, uh, verse 13 through 21. And King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. He has a widow's son of the tribe of uh, Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, worker in brass, and he was filled with wisdom and understanding and cunning to work, all work in brass. And he came to King Solomon and wrought all his work. For he cast two pillars of brass of 18 cubits high apiece. That's about 50 feet. And a line of 12 cubits did compass either of them about. And he made two chapters of molten brass to set upon the tops of the pillars. The height of one chapter was five cubits and the height of the other chapter was five cubits. And the nets of the checker work and the rest of the chain work for the chapters, which were upon the top of the pillars, seven for one chapter and seven for the other. Very detailed uh, description here. And he made the pillars in two rows round about upon the one network to cover the chapters that were upon the top with pomegranates, and so he did for the other. And the chapters that were in top, upon the top of the pillars were of lily work and the porch four cubits. And the chapters upon the two pillars had pomegranates also above, uh, over against the belly, which was by the network. And the pomegranates were 200 in rows round about upon the other chapters. And he said, all to get to this, uh, all to get to this particular verse. And he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar, and he called the name of it Jackin, and he set up the left pillar, and they called the name thereof Boaz. So you can see the word Boaz was used. And I couldn't help but think about the fact, well, I wonder why it was named Boaz. Was it because of Boaz of Ruth? And I came across an idea, and I can't get it proven to myself except in my own mind at the moment. Uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, what these things mean. Uh, I just mentioned that, uh, I already mentioned that uh, they're about 45 feet tall and had a circumference of about 18 feet. The brass used made the twin pillars had been taken by King David for King of Zopat as part of the spoils of war. So uh, King David actually gotten that brass from uh, during a war. Now, let me talk about the, two, the names. The pillar on the south of the entrance, which was called Jackin, 
and one on the north named Boaz. Both Second Chronicles and First Kings say that he set up the pillars and he named them Jachin and Boaz. Commentators are divided on, on whether he refers to Hiram or Solomon. Uh, but I'm kind of swaying towards Solomon, mainly because of the tie-in with, uh, with uh, uh, Boaz. Whoever named them, their names are significant. Jackin pronounced, actually it's pronounced Yakin, means he will establish. And Boaz signifies in him is strength. Taken together, the names were a reminder that God would establish the temple and the worship of his name in strength. The pillars Jackin and Boaz were destroyed along with the rest of the temple by the Chaldeans in Jeremiah uh, 52, 17. It mentions it here. Also, the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord and the brass and the brazen sea that was in the house of the Lord. The Chaldeans break and carried all the brass of them to Babylon. Uh, so that was the last they saw of those. But the names lived on uh, in the spiritual kingdom of God. The names of the pillars represent the strength and stability of God's promise of a kingdom that will last forever. And so that uh, as you approach the temple, it's supposed to uh, put in your mind the fact that uh, uh, that uh, that you're, in, you're going into God's temple and that uh, God's temple will live forever. And we see this, this, this promise mentioned over in uh, Daniel 6. Uh, and I thought I put it in here already. That's why I write it in my notes. Daniel 6, 26, something we just uh, recently read. I will make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his, he, this is the part, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be ever unto the end. Luke 133. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. This is all talking about Jesus. Hebrews 1.8. But under the sun he saith, Thou throne, O God, is forever and ever. A sepulchre of righteousness is the sepulchre of the kingdom. And last but not least, over in Revelation eleven fifteen, And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voice in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So I can see here that uh, as Solomon was a great, great grandson of Ruth and Boaz, uh, and so the idea that the symbol of our kinsman redeemer being Jesus Christ is symbolized with these two pillars and their meaning uh, that uh, uh, the kingdom will last forever. So I can see this tie in. I can't prove it with another commentary, but it kind of makes sense to me. So uh, the fact that it makes sense to me, maybe it's the Holy Spirit speaking to me, but uh, uh, or it's just my imagination. But either way, I think it's a cool uh, thing to think about uh, that the uh, that maybe Solomon named one of these based on his great great grandfather uh, Boaz. Now, as for Jackin, Jackin shows up in uh, in the uh, Bible a couple of times. Uh, he was the son of uh, Simeon uh, back in Genesis and uh, Exodus, I believe it's written, and that he was a uh, priest uh, during the period of the first tabernacle, and so that. Uh, there is some uh, Levitical, uh, what they call, uh, what do they call it? Oh, when uh, theory, not a theory, but a, a, hist uh, a histor uh, historical, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word I'm looking for. It's when, it's when the rabbis have a uh, tradition, tradition. It's a tradition that uh, uh, Jackin was one of the first ones to dedicate the temple uh, but uh, I can't prove it in the Bible, and I can't find any verses that support that. So, uh, not sure where Jackin came from, except it has a meaning, meaning he will establish. Uh, so, continuing on, <clears throat> Ruth 2.20. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us? One of our next kinsmen. Man is near kin. Not, it's not in the form of a question. The man is near kin unto us. One of our near next kinsmen. So he and I, uh, Ruth is going to find out about this idea of the kinsman. 
What I find interesting here is Ruth doesn't tell, I mean, Naomi doesn't tell her yet uh, what she needs to do to, uh, to, to do this. She's going to kind of let the, uh, sounds like she's going to let the relationship develop a little bit first. Because realize that the Kingsman Redeemer is his option to do it. He doesn't have to. And so I think that uh, Ruth being, I mean, Naomi being a uh, uh, knowledgeable Jewish woman knows that uh, the timing of this is important. And so she knows the exact timing. And we'll talk about that when we get into chapter three quite a bit. But talking about blessings, uh, over in Job, a nice little verse here in chapter 29, verse 12 and 13. Because I delivered the poor that cried and the fatherless and him that had none to help him, the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. That was Job that mentioned that. And so fitting here that uh, after uh, uh, Naomi heard that Ruth was working for Boaz and that Boaz was like really giving her lots of uh, uh, attention. Uh, I'm sure that the wheels started turning and Naomi's head going, oh, this could work out to our, our benefit. So I'm sure she was quite happy. And, and she mentioned kindness to the uh, dead. Uh, we see another reference in that in 2 Samuel 9.1. And David said, David said, is there yet anything that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Some of these things are interesting to me because uh, I think there's a lot can be said about things that are, are passed down from generation to generation. That's why I mentioned the Boaz thing. And here we see David. Uh, David was the uh, uh, great-grandson of Boaz and Ruth. Uh, he may not have personally known them. So not, it doesn't record exactly when Boaz and Ruth died. So we don't know for sure how, how long they lived. Uh, and so that, uh, it's possible that David uh, knew them. But either, the, either way, uh, Obed uh, and or Jesse could have uh, taken these same traditions and passed them on down. And then they ended up with David. So that's why I like to mention that, that tie-in with Boaz. They might have gone all the way down to Solomon. We're talking about kindness uh, for living. Uh, over in Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Uh, it means that uh, you know, through adversity sometimes is when, when the greatest friendships develop. Uh, Philippians 4.10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now at the last you care of, of me, hath flourishing again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Uh, so that the opportunity is going to present itself. I can see it. And talking about Kingsman, I uh, just uh, will refresh, uh, we'll look at a couple of verses here. But again, I'm really going to spell this out when we get into the actual time that, uh, that uh, Boaz uh, becomes the kinsman. Redeemer of uh, Naomi, and then I'll tie it into when uh, when uh, how the Lord is our kinsman redeemer. Let's review a couple of verses here in Leviticus twenty five twenty five. If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possessions, and if any of his his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. Deuteronomy twenty five five through seven. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to be to him to wife and to perform the duty of the husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which shall beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of the Israel. That's how Naomi is going to end up with an heir uh, that will continue. So Obed is actually, even though Ruth uh, and Boaz are the, are the mother and father, biologically, it's actually going to be an heir of uh, Naomi. And it's kind of a weird, and this is the verse that talks about that. So it's going to be symbolically a uh, heir of uh, Naomi's to be able to redeem the land. And that's how it's going to kind of work out. Verse 7. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband and brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Uh, we'll talk about that also. That's going to come into play. Well, back to Job again. Talk about a tie into Jesus. Uh, over in 19, Job 19.25. 
For I know that my redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Uh, this is Job. This is the first written uh, book of the Bible. Uh, it was even before Moses. And uh, here we see a, a prophecy uh, that uh, was fulfilled through Jesus. Now, Naomi has a plan formulating. I can see it. She now knows that Boaz, as a near kinsman, has shown favor, Ruth favor. So as a good Jewish mom, tells her daughter to stay with this good fortune. She probably already knows what to do next, but we'll give it a bit of time to come to fruition. So let's just finish off here with the, this conversation that Ruth and Naomi are having. And Ruth the Moabitess said, He said unto me also that thou shalt keep fast by my young men uh, until they have ended all my harvest. I might mention too that here, uh, young men, uh, could be women too. Uh, that word, uh, we see it here in Proverbs 27.10. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of calamity. For better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. Uh, that's talking about it is good that, uh, uh, I wanted to mention that for us. It was good when it said uh, that it was good that she had uh, come into favor with, uh, with Boaz. But also that word young man, uh, comes uh, from a Greek, uh, from a Hebrew word, henarim, uh, and it should be, and it's actually more of a generic word uh, for a servant, a servant, and it could be either male or female, so it's a generic term, it's probably like saying mankind, you know, like kind of in that, in that same realm, or to comply to either sex. Verse 22, and Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, I like that, uh, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee, thee not in any other field. So keep going back there, she's telling her. Uh, again, I think this idea is formulating in Ruth's mind, in Naomi's mind. An interesting, uh, there was an interesting tradition, too, that I found that, uh, Again, uh, back to these things that uh, are known as like historical knowns by the rabbis that are passed down by oral tradition. Uh, one tradition uh, that uh, came out of the, uh, uh, the Talmud was that Ruth was actually the daughter of Eglon, king of Moab. And it might have been uh, kind of uh, uh, one of the reasons she wanted to leave was that uh, she didn't agree with some of the things her father did. Uh, so that uh, interesting tie in there. I uh, don't know if it's true or not. It's not, I don't have any biblical evidence for it. But I just started throwing that little tidbit. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So that ends the chapter. And we're going to move into uh, the next step, uh, chapter three, starting next week. And that's the fun part where we're going to get into Kinsman Redeemer and spell it out uh, much better as we see how uh, Boaz kind of uh, does it for Ruth and uh, Naomi. And I'm going to tie it into how the Lord is our Kingsman Redeemer. So that's what I have for today. And let's end with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, so much uh, for this time we get to spend in your word. And Lord, uh, thank you so much for being our Kingsman Redeemer. We praise you and thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, you guys have a good weekend, and it's Easter weekend, so I'll see you all uh, Sunday. Looking forward to it. Uh, sunrise service and uh, breakfast to follow, and looking forward to all that. So we'll see you all then. Have a good Saturday.